many obvious reasons. The United States, notwithstanding the events of the last few years, remains the premier, most important global power. Its influence and impact crosses all time zones for both good and not so good impact. Particularly in the case of Pakistan, the United States has been the most important foreign policy partner for the past seven decades. There should be absolutely no doubt about it. Which is why, if Ambassador Nadeem Riaz permits me, I want to go a little back into history. Why? Because not all of you are as knowledgeable as some of you. Even before Pakistan was established, the leadership of the Pakistan, sorry, of the All India Muslim League was already probing possibilities of establishing a meaningful relationship with the country that they were striving to bring about. And interestingly enough, this is very important for the young here to note that contrary to Indian propaganda and contrary to Western propaganda, there was no sympathy or support for the concept of Pakistan in the United States. Because you know, there is a school amongst Indians that claims that Pakistan was the result of a conspiracy of the Western powers. Now that all the archives have been released, transcripts of the conversations held by the All India Muslim League leaders with the US Charge in Delhi, Mr. Grady, as well as the council in Karachi, adequately and abundantly rejects this propaganda. In fact, the American administration under President Roosevelt was not only keen on an early freedom for the Indian subcontinent, but was convinced that a full, whole, complete subcontinent would be a major power that would promote American interests in this part of the world. This is very significant that the administration should have been looking at the possibility of embracing India in a meaningful economic and security relationship. Then immediately after the establishment of Pakistan, when the US charged the affairs met Mr. Jinnah, Mr. Jinnah made it very clear in his own pronouncements that while Pakistan sought good relations with all foreign countries, its sympathies lay with the United States. Please note this. Why? Because the United States was a democracy. I repeat, the United States was a democracy and a liberal democracy. And the Pakistanis were overwhelmingly Muslims, and therefore they did not or could not sympathize with the Soviet Union, which had incorporated the entire Central Asian region into the Soviet Union. In fact, it had been incorporated more than 100 years earlier during the Tsars. Also, soon after the establishment of Pakistan, a delegation was sent to the United States, led by Mir Lakali, 
and you can understand the gulf, the ignorance of understanding on both sides, that the Pakistani delegation that was sent to Washington to seek assistance carried a request for the astronomical figure of $2 billion. We are seeking $2 billion when? In 1948. You can well imagine what that translates to in the current exchange rate. But the poor Pakistanis had no idea. So somebody must have told them $2 billion was a very good sum. It's a nice round sum. It will meet all your needs. Primarily economic needs. This is also very important for you to note that the Pakistani requirement was for the economic sector of the country, primarily arising from the influx of millions of Muslims from the newly established Indian Republic who had trekked literally on their feet into Pakistan. The Pakistani leadership was also still quite sure that their desire, the Pakistani desire for cordial relations with India would be reciprocated. Mr. Jinnah went on telling all foreign visitors that he envisaged after his term of office as governor general to go for his rest and recreation to his house in Bombay. These are important things for you to note that these were the ideals that then were being espoused by the Pakistani leadership. And Mr. Jinnah even went to the extent of telling Margaret Booth, who was editor of the very famous magazine Life, which you may see in some libraries, that he envisaged a relationship between Pakistan and India that would be very similar to the relationship between the United States and Canada. But these turned out to be unfulfilled dreams because the Indian Congress party very soon revealed its true colors through both the small and big decisions. Refusal to pay Pakistan's share of the assets that we should have received. Deciding to switch off the water flowing into the rivers into Pakistan. And taking military action in Hyderabad, Junagat, after it had already incorporated forcibly the state of Jammu and Kashmir through a fraudulent agreement with the Maharaja, which they have never been able to produce to this day. It is neither available in the Indian archives nor in the British archives. Now, once this relationship had become hostile, Pakistan immediately recognized that we needed a support of a country that could assist and aid in Pakistan's defense needs. Now, this is also important to note that we did not go to America for our arms and armaments when we were still hopeful of establishing a cordial relationship with India. It was only after India's actions, and especially after the pronouncement of Sardar, Sardar Vallabhai Patel, the strongman of the government, the home minister of the Indian government, that made the Pakistanis aware of the fact that there would be no such thing as a cordial relationship between Pakistan and India. Now, I wish, may I suggest, Mr. President, that you should always have on your walls a map of the world. No foreign policy practitioner should ever be deprived of this. Because if you had that, 
I would have actually told you that Pakistan had no other alternative but to approach the United States. And why do I say that? Look at the world as it was in 1947, 48, 49. The world war had ended. Out of the ruins of that world war, the only country to have emerged with far bigger, more robust economy was the United States. The United States economy was a booming economy thanks to its massive defense industry that was manufacturing tanks and guns and aircraft and sending them to the European war front. The Soviets had suffered grievously. According to official archives, they lost 20 million of their citizens during the course of the Second World War. The entire industrial belt of the Kursk region was destroyed. They had the Marxist ideology, true, which was a great attraction to the young of Europe. But they had no money and no means of assisting anyone. China had only just emerged from its own civil war. The Chinese were going through huge food scarcity that was resulting in the death of tens of thousands. Great Britain, bread and eggs were being rationed, were being rationed. France lay in ruins. Now, where else could a country seeking assistance go? Whose door could Pakistan knock other than the doors of Washington, D.C.? I am giving you this background again because some people fault the leadership of the time for having approached the United States. I'm not defending myself or my generation. I am old, but not that old. These, this was my father's generation. But they actually had no option. And the more I read, not merely Pakistani authors, but American authors, the more I recognize the legitimacy and validity of the Pakistani initiative. Anyway, with the Cold War becoming more intense, America's recognition that even though the Soviet Union was economically weak, but its ideology held a very strong interest. Italy and Greece may possibly have fallen to the Communist Party in the late 40s. The Communist Party was very strong and active in France as well. And with China going to the Chinese Communist Party, the Americans suddenly discovered that there will be a Cold War that will be as intense as any war could be. And therefore, the Americans started looking for allies in strategic areas of the globe. And if I had the map, I would have shown you, yes, the map is there, that Pakistan enjoyed a unique importance, a unique importance. Look at where Pakistan is. This is not the Pakistan that existed in 1947. Pakistan was on two flanks of the subcontinent. With the Western flank, it was part of Central Asia, part of the Gulf, part of the Middle East. With East Pakistan, it was part of Southeast Asia. Please understand this. Its strategic advantages were unique. We had a highly trained, skilled forces. We had a landmass. And as Muslims, we had strong connections with the Middle East, Central Asia, and the Gulf. And therefore, in the eyes of Washington, there was no other country that could be of as much use and advantage as Pakistan. Which is why, which is why Pakistan got membership of 
two of the most important American military alliances. CENTO, which was earlier known as the Baghdad Pact, which was to protect American interest in the Middle East, and CETO, Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, which was meant to protect American interests against China, Vietnam, and Korea. That is how we fit in into American scheme. Now, once we became members of those two military alliances, we began receiving both economic assistance, military assistance. Whether it was good or bad, that is for posterity, that is for history to say, whether this massive influx of military arms did us good or not, but we did receive it. Okay. In 1954, we, did, we had not one, not two, but actually three major agreements with the United States. Three. We had also given them the facilities that from Peshawar's airport, their spy planes were flying all over the Soviet Union, one of which was actually shot down. Gary Powers was captured and so on. But from 54, roughly, 54 to 64 was the heyday of Pakistan-US relations, which led Ayub Khan, when he was addressing the US Congress, to tell the US legislators that Pakistan was such a loyal and faithful ally of the United States that when everyone else has abandoned you, we shall remain loyal to you. Which also led many Americans to say that Pakistan is the most allied ally of the United States, which later in the late 80s and 90s, when, when they cut off all assistance, I told the media and the people in Islamabad got very angry with me. I said, from a stage where we were the most allied ally, Today, we are the most sanctioned ally because in September 1991, President George Bush informed us officially through his letter to President Ghulam Isa Khan that all forms of assistance, military, economic, social, all was being brought to an end because of what the Americans perceived to be a violation of Article 620 of the Foreign Assistance Act of 1962, and as a result, which is colloquially known as the Bressler Amendment, we had violated that. So that is one period. Then again, you see international requirements of the United States, its global ambitions led the United States to once again embrace this country when the Soviets, in December 1979, marched into Afghanistan. And the Carter administration initially, and then soon thereafter, a few months later, the Reagan administration decided that the Soviet action was in violation of its global commitments, and that it is not only Afghanistan, but it could be tomorrow beyond Afghanistan. And General Ziaul Haq, may his soul rest in peace, use this to great advantage to continually hammer in Washington that Afghanistan is only the first step that the Russians or the Soviets are actually planning on moving next into Pakistan and eventually the warm waters of the Indian Ocean. So again, we became a close friend and ally, okay? That was 80 to 90, so another 10 years. So for another 10 years, we were close partners when we got sanctioned. Then came another event of global importance, the 9-11. Once again, the United States needed us. And once again, to the good luck of the United States and to the good luck of the military dictator then in power in Pakistan, he jumped at this opportunity to embrace the Americans. And we not only agreed to what the Americans wanted, but as the Americans themselves have written, 
he offered much more than what they want. So we offered, and again became partners with the United States. 2001, and then 10 years later, again 10 years later, 10 year cycles. You remember Raymond Davis, Osama bin Laden, the Salala massacre of Pakistani soldiers. And once again, the relationship went into a spin. Now coming to the subject of today's lecture, with Ambassador Nadeem, I wanted to give you a little bit of the background. Relations are going through an extremely rough patch. There's no doubt about it. The Pakistani narrative is that we had all along been telling you that the government that you have established in Kabul has no credibility. It has no appeal to the people. They are corrupt. They are inefficient and incapable. And what you need to do is to bring all these stakeholders and promote a common approach within Afghanistan and around Afghanistan, what is known as the regional approach. We don't want to do it, but the countries that are in the region that have a stake in ensuring that Afghanistan remains peaceful and orderly, you need. You haven't done this. You have counted investment in Afghanistan, which people claim could be even more than $2 trillion. There's nothing to show for $2 trillion, neither in terms of economic development or social development or even defense development, but $2 trillion have certainly been wasted. So all along, from 2010 onwards, we do know, and these youngsters, these two young ambassadors sitting there, they were in the foreign office. The refrain from the American was that you are not being honest, that even though you are denying it, but having very close relations with the Taliban, particularly what is known as the Haqqani network, and that you are providing them safe havens, you are providing them facilities for training, for travel, for gathering donations. And this is why we have been unable in Afghanistan to destroy them. So you are partly responsible for their continued existence in Afghanistan. We, of course, went on saying so that we do not control the Taliban. Yes, we have some influence amongst them, and we are willing to promote a reconciliation process between the Taliban and the Kabul government, provided you are willing to also nudge Kabul towards the negotiating table. And as a matter of fact, we did succeed in bringing them together in Mari, you would recall, in 2015, and they had an initial meeting. And the next meeting was supposed to take place. And two days before that meeting, an American drone attack killed Mullah Mansoor, who was at that time the leader of the Taliban. And obviously, the Taliban were then not interested in any further meetings. But the point is that because of all the doubts, suspicions, misgivings about our role, the Americans were always trying to place the blame on us that we are not being successful in Afghanistan because of your role. And there is nothing secret about it. You must have read in the newspapers, must have read in the books. In fact, Adam Mullen, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs in, in his final testimony before the Senate Armed Services Committee, made it very clear. He used the phrase, the ISI is the veritable arm of the Taliban. What more can be said? Now that's their side. Our side 
denied, he of course denied it. We said we are a neighbor, we have relations that go back to thousands of years, we provided refuge to more than three million people, two million are still in Pakistan, and obviously they are coming and going, they have relationship that go back to many generations, but we are not in any way providing aid or assistance to the militants, to the warriors, to the jihadists. But frankly, it did not touch much eyes. I do remember that uh, in the meetings that I was present uh, during 1318, that whether it was President uh, Obama or Vice President Biden or uh, National Security Advisor Susan Rice, whoever, they always said, are convinced that yes, you are a friend of ours, yes, you are an ally of ours, but you are not being honest with us, that you are hedging your bets, that you are playing both sides of the street. Even when Trump came to office after Obama was gone, and his secretary Tillerson, when he came, I think it was in in October or November 2016, he made it very clear to the Prime Minister of that time, Mr. Shahid Khakan Abbasi, that we are convinced that you are playing a double game. You are not being honest with us. I'm repeating all this only in order to tell you that there was already a huge backlog of complaints, of suspicions, of doubts. Therefore, when President Biden came into office, you must have seen that President Biden did not show and has not shown till today any indication of the many years during which he told us that he wanted friendly relations with Pakistan. I had mentioned here, or maybe in some other institute, I don't remember, that I was more worried about President Biden than I was about President Trump. And this will surprise you. Trump was erratic, occasionally even irrational, he was given to emotional hours, but if you could abuse you in the morning, he could invite you in the evening. Biden, on the other hand, is a product of the institution, the Washington institution. He has been engaged in foreign policy issues for the past 40 years in the time that he spent in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and later he was actually the chairman of the committee as well. And then for eight years, he has been the vice president. So obviously, his reactions would be those that would emerge from the institutions, from his advisors, from the State Department, the Defense Department, the CIA, the National Security Council, the various committees of Congress. And therefore, People in Pakistan were surprised, I was not, that he has not shown any warmth towards Pakistan, notwithstanding the fact that he has come to Pakistan many times. He has met the leaders of Pakistan, the Muslim League leaders, the People's Party leaders, the PTI leaders. He has met many of the senior army officers of Pakistan. And yet, it seems, to me it seems, I could be wrong, that he continues to be deeply influenced by the events of the previous 10, 12 years. And he still is keeping that in his mind. And that became further accentuated by the manner in which the American withdrawal has taken place. The truth is, the truth is that a third rate country would have carried out a withdrawal with greater skill 
and professionalism than was demonstrated by the United States. For the past many decades, we had been talking of the very human withdrawal of the Americans from Vietnam, where their people had to be picked up from the roof of the American embassy. Well, this was far worse. And this was the age of instant television, where what was happening in Kabul was being seen at that very moment without a second's delay in all the capitals of the world. And the helplessness and the utter confusion with which the American withdrawal took place does not speak very highly of their skill when it comes to carrying out an operation of this nature. Now, obviously, in the United States, the Republicans wanted to take advantage of it and came down heavily on the president, on the Secretary of State, Blinken, and the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd. But the point is, Lloyd Austin, the point is that more than anger with the administration, the overall catalyst for American outrage was the humiliation there and the object of their anger and uh, rancor is Pakistan. So on already a very fertile ground in which suspicions were there for all these years, the withdrawal and the manner in which the withdrawal has taken place has added to that. Even though I want to tell you, I'm not part of the government, I'm totally free of any government responsibility. I want to tell you that in fact, Pakistan did play a positive role. I'm saying this with great confidence because had Pakistan not used influence with the Taliban, it would have been difficult for even that withdrawal to take place in the last chaotic days. And isn't it ironic that the American command in Kabul had to request the Taliban to enter Kabul and take control of the situation so that their planes could take on. The very Taliban that they wanted to destroy, they sought the assistance because the Ashraf government had dissolved. Dissolved like Snow dissolves at the first sun shine on it. So the 10, 20, 50, 100, whatever aircraft that were able to take off, were able to take off only because the Taliban provided the security services at the airport. And I'm sure, I don't know, I'm quite sure our people must have also used their influence tell the Taliban that it would be to their advantage. It does not serve any purpose for you to keep the Americans as hostage. Now the American demand, the European demand, everybody is demanding that the Taliban should behave. What do they mean by behave? That the Taliban should ensure human rights. That the Taliban should ensure that they have an inclusive government that the Taliban should in special case, more importantly, show understanding, respect for the women folk and for the minorities, which is all wonderful. I totally support those demands. But please understand that the Taliban for 20 long years have been engaged in a struggle for survival. They were being killed with less concern than you killed wild boars that you see coming out of the hills of Margala. That entire wedding families, that entire funeral families were blown up by drones without seconds of hesitation. Even when the evacuation was taking place, they used a drone to blow up a car in which their own people were there. How tragic, how tragic it is. So there are two sides of the story. And 
American anger, disappointment, rancor is understandable. But they, we, Pakistan, should not be made a target for American anger and disappointment at their own follies. If they did not understand or appreciate or anticipate the events, it's not our fault. Imagine that they had the biggest bases, not one, they had more than two dozen bases in Afghanistan. They had a huge contingent of CIA and intelligence agency agents. They had their own supporters in every town city. And yet, these so very intelligent people, they were expecting that the Ashraf government would last for six months to a year. It did not last for six hours. Because unless you have a stake in that particular country, you're not going to be. It's as simple as that. These were all people who were serving Kabul for money, not for commitment, not for loyalty, not for patriotism. The Taliban, on the other hand, I am no admirer of Taliban. And I don't ever hope and pray that we have a government like that. At least my wife and children will never want to live in those conditions. But the truth is that when you are fighting for your own home and your homeland, you fight and give your life. But when you are a mercy, you are fighting because you are being paid, you're not willing to lay down your life. Now, the current situation is that American disappointment with us made public. It's being spoken about every day. We, on the other hand, if I may be to say so, we have made a few mistakes. They're not grievous mistakes, but they are mistakes. For one, you see, please understand that A, I'm an old man. And B, I have been a diplomat all my life. So we were taught by our that a diplomat should always speak cautiously, sparingly, meaning he should not talk too much. Unfortunately, the current leadership believes in talking much too much and much too often. Now, when you speak with this frequency, you make mistakes. And your words become weapons that cause injury to the other side. That's one. Two, we should not be espousing, we should not be highlighting the needs of the Taliban government in Kabul with the frequency and with the velocity that we have been doing. We should get others to do it. Because everybody knows that we have a very old relationship with the Taliban. So for us to say that we should do this or not do that doesn't ring the right bells in foreign countries. I think the initiative of carrying the vision was a good initiative, is a good initiative, and Pakistan should continue to push Iran, China, Russia, Turkey, Qatar, and others to speak for the Taliban and for assistance to Taliban. And we should kind of take a lower profile than the profile that we have maintained on the issue of Afghanistan. Because we all know that Afghanistan needs assistance. We all know that they need money economic assistance, social assistance, material assistance, food assistance. Otherwise, there will be famine. People will go hungry. And if they go hungry, they will start marching towards Pakistan. And there is no way that we can physically and forcibly stop them from coming into Pakistan. And, but we should let this narrative be used by other neighboring countries, Central Asians, because if people start pushing towards Central Asians, the Central Asians have a, a strong stake in a peaceful Afghanistan. They are worried about militancy. They are worried about uh, narcotics and generally about lawlessness. So they are the ones who should be talking more about it. 
So I expect that the relationship with the United States will remain disturbed for the coming years. One with Ambassador Nadim, if you permit me, and two minutes, sir. In the meanwhile, interestingly enough, as if we did not have enough problems between Pakistan and the United States, now the issue of China has also come to become a major irritant in US-Pakistan relations. In fact, I want to tell you that if there is one issue in the United States on which the Republicans and the Democrats are on one page, on which everyone is on the one page, whether they are scholars or practitioners of foreign policy, that is on China. China is being built as a big horror story that, you know, in the old days, in Russia, when I was studying there, my children were studying in the primary schools, the parents would tell the children to go to bed, with the young kids, two, three years, by telling them, if you don't go to bed, the Mongols are coming. Now, the Mongols have not gone into Russia for 1,000 years, in fact, for 1,200 years. But that memory of what the Mongols did to Russia is imprinted in the minds of the common people. The Mongols are coming. They, even the children's rhymes in Arden talks about it. So in America, I went there last month, or the month before, and everyone was there was talking of this issue. China is becoming a threat. We need to contain China. What exactly do you mean contain China? You are not interested in competing with China. You want to contain China and not permit China to go beyond certain limits. Now, you know that in the last two, three, four years, major scholars have written books on China. And in 2019 and 20, uh, 2020, I went through a list of the books that have been published in America by American authors on China. And you will be amazed to note that I picked up 20 books in 2019. And out of the 20 books, 19 reached the conclusion that war between the United States and China is inevitable. If you reach that kind of a conclusion, it becomes what in English is known as a self-fulfilling nightmare. You are convinced that the guy is going to come and kill you. So even if he doesn't kill you, you die because of the shock. That's the situation in America. And Putin is going about this with greater skill and greater effectiveness. Trump would only issue a statement and make a few tweets about trade sanctions. Biden wants to create a whole structure. Obama's original policy, the pivot to the East, you will remember, which Secretary Clinton had stated in her speech at Chennai in 2010. Obama then made it into the pivot. Now Biden has actually, by virtue of getting the Australians and the British to cooperate in defense, by getting the Indians into the quad, why do you need a quad? Who is China threatening? But if a global coalition is to be made, we will be the odd man out. Please understand this. In the American constructed coalition, we are the odd man out because we cannot, under any circumstances, be part of any scheme that is going to be anti China. Question doesn't arise. So if we come in it, and we are out of it, so then we become the focus of antagonism from Washington and the other members of the Quad. So it has become a major issue for us. And this was there even in earlier years. Every time the Americans came or the World Bank came, they spoke of the fact that the Chinese assistance 
would enslave Pakistan, that China would take over Pakistan, and why the hell are you guys going through CPEC? So I would tell them, okay, we'll drop CPEC. What are you willing to give us? We can't give you anything. So what do you expect a poor country, a developing country like Pakistan? So China, containment of China, and the American desire to incorporate India into this particular arrangement, which incidentally the Modi government is very enthusiastic about, creates huge problems for us in coming years. Thank you all very much. I'll be happy to respond to your questions. Sorry, Nadeem, I went. So thank you so much. Uh, enlightened. Yeah, my name is Khaled. I am a PhD scholar at Beria University. Uh, so my question to you, sir, is why Pakistan is unable to clarify its position to the US? Uh, when I say position, this means uh, what we think about uh, our position on Taliban. So why we are unable to communicate uh, it clearly to the US? Thank you. I'm sorry, many Sunani. Yes. <laughs> you see, in order to explain yourselves to anyone, whether your wife or your brother or your cousin the other side must also be in the mood to listen to you. You can't explain unless the other side, there is no willingness, my dear friend, there is no willingness in Washington to listen to the Pakistani narrative because the Pakistani narrative does not help the Biden administration, A, in passing the responsibility for the fiasco in Afghanistan on Pakistan's shoulders, number one. And number two, on a long term, a strategic plane, a Pakistan's partnership with China. So they're not interested. And unless the equation changes, I don't see it improving. And of course, if I had been there, I would have never, never said, why am I not getting a telephone call? Even if my girlfriend wasn't calling, I wouldn't be saying so publicly. To hell with her. To hell with him. He doesn't want to speak. Fine. I'm perfectly comfortable in my own shoes. G, please, sir. So my name is Shiraz and I work for Radio Pakistan in the current affairs and all. Allah bachaye. Kahan se aapne journeys ko bula liya, yaar? I'm not the journalist, but I'm a student of IR as well. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, so what is exactly the options Pakistan government has at the moment? Because, you know, since we know that, you know, uh, can we can we have any, uh, I mean, for example, if we go with China, and obviously the US is not really happy with it. Hmm. Can we go with China all along now? Is this the right time? Because we have to really finalize what, who are we with and who are we not. Okay. ये इन्होंने बहुत अच्छा सवाल किया और ये कह रहे हैं कि हम फैसला करें कि हम इनके साथ हैं ये कैथलिक मैं आप समझते हैं यू अंडरस्टैंड रिलीजन ये कैथलिक मैरिज नहीं है समझा आपने ये बच्चों ने नहीं समझा कैथलिक मजहब में आप दूसरी शादी भी नहीं कर सकते हैं अल्लाह का शुक्र है इस्लाम में तो आपको बड़े ऑप्शंस हैं पहली बात है दैट्स ऑन ए लाइटर नोट बट ऑन अ मोर सीरियस नोट मैं आपको बताना चाहता हूं कि डिप्लोमेसी में यह पढ़ाया जाता है आपको पहले दिन से कि आप यू डू नॉट शट डोर्स यू ओपन डोर्स याद रखिए ये कोई डिप्लोमेसी नहीं है कि हम अमेरिका का दरवाजा बंद करके चीन का खुला रखें यह तो हर बच्चा भी कर सकता है कमाल तो आपका यह है और आपके लोगों का और आपके लीडरशिप का और आपके डिप्लोमेसी का कि आप दोनों दरवाजा खुला रखें और नहीं भी खुला तो आपकी कोशिश यही होनी चाहिए 
as a small country living next door to India with a BJP government headed by Modi, you cannot shut the door to Washington. No way, sir. You have to go on constantly telling them that, yes, we are a very responsible country. We are a country that wishes to move in peaceful cooperation. And this is also your negative. We want to be friends from India. We want to be cooperation. There is no response from them. They have made a lot of violence in the whole country. Now, the Indian TV is also believing. The international journalists are believing. The international human rights organization is believing. You can highlight that. In Kashmir, the atrocities that they have done, you can highlight that. No, sir. No, sir. You cannot America with Rus apna darwaza nahi ban karta hai. Aap kaisi baat kar rahe hai? Woh zamana khatam ho gaya ke aap jo hai blocks ke ban jayein aur blocks. Dekhiye. Isi liye history aapko batai pichla hai ke that was a different time. It was a global confrontation called two rival camps. China ke dekhiye uske diplomacy ki still dekhiye. The Chinese want relations. They want continue working with America. They are into American technology, American investment, American trade, and so on. So we must. Our messaging has to improve. Our messaging has to be more frequent. We have to get our friends to speak for us. We have to use the Pakistani community, which is very influential in America. to speak for us we have to speak to the traders the businessmen the economists in america to tell them ke bhai don't ignore this is a country of 220 million people we have huge influence among the muslim world aap hame ignore na kare just because you want to befriend india ji ji please assalam alaikum Uh, this is Ibrahim Niyazi from National University of Modern Languages. From National University of Modern Languages. Ji. I am a student of international relations. Sir, I have a question that, uh, as you look at after uh, U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, they are totally focused towards Indo-Pacific politics, and they are doing a lot of things. How can it create implication for Pakistan uh, in case of India? They are providing. How can create implication for Pakistan and the possible options uh, to react uh, in such condition? at they are doing in indo pacific politics and another question is that uh, as you said that there might be a chance of war uh, between us and china how can you see that in such uh, interconnected and uh, uh, dependency and globalized world how can it affect the world peace thank you sir dekhiye i'll come to the second part first dependency there is no dependency of pakistan on china This is a Western propaganda. ये 2014 में जब एग्रीमेंट 2015 के अप्रैल 